Hi, good uh, day, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you happen to be tuning in from. Uh, my name is Graham Codrington, and thank you for joining this Simply Biz webinar. Uh, I know that the webinar is being recorded, and so uh, you might not be live with us uh, today. If you are live with us uh, today, this is the 29th of April. Uh, you will be able to interact with me uh, towards the end of this webinar, and you're welcome to go into the chat or the uh, questions section of the Livestorm app and put in any questions as we go along. I'll have an opportunity for questions at the end, and I'll have a look at all of the written questions as we go along. So uh, please feel free to do that. As I said, my name is Graham Codrington. I work for a company called Tomorrow Today are futurists. Now, a futurist is not somebody who predicts the future. I honestly wish I could. Uh, but of course, if I could predict the future, I wouldn't be doing this for a living. I'd be living on a private island somewhere, maybe even my own planet. Uh, we, we Futurists don't predict the future. We look at trends. We look at uh, forecasts, we develop scenarios. And of course, one of the big questions at the moment is, did we predict COVID-19? The answer is actually yes. Uh, 15 years ago, our team uh, wrote in a book about the future, and in fact, about the 2020s. We talked about a number of scenarios, and one of those scenarios uh, was a global pandemic that shut down all travel. Uh, in fact, President Obama, whenever he was asked during his eight years as United States president, what keeps you up at night, sir? Um, his answer was always a global pandemic. The CIA and, and his intelligence officers in the United States always thought that a global pandemic of the type we're living through now was the most disruptive thing that could happen. So we've kind of known about this, but of course, it's too big an event to actually plan for. And so when it happens, you kind of just got to deal with it as it happens. It's not that we didn't know it wouldn't come, but it's impossible to, to have huge plans for it. So that's what this webinar is about. And maybe it's a bit cheesy and corny. Maybe I'm showing my age a bit, calling it ACDC. But we're going to have a look at after and during COVID. What's going to happen for the next few weeks, the next few months, and the next few years? And what can you do about it? And um, I'm going to take about 35 minutes or so uh, to talk through some of my scenarios and give you uh, an update, as I say, uh, updated as at the end of April. Uh, but we are going to look ahead for the months and years. And uh, then if, if you need to leave, that, that's great. But if you want to stick around for a while, I don't have to run anywhere. And I can spend uh, a few minutes answering questions, engaging uh, with all of you who are here live. Um, I'll also give you my details. So if you're watching a replay of this, uh, you'd be welcome to get hold of me. So um, look, <laughs> let me start off by saying I'm, I'm a motivational speaker, so this is not necessarily going to be the best news that you've ever heard, uh, but hopefully hearing what I believe is the most likely scenario is going to help you in your business, is going to help you and your family even think about what the next few months and years might look like. So let's start with what we can expect for the next few weeks. I hope you can see the screen. I do have some slides. It's not essential. I'll, I'll call your attention to the screen when there are any particular slides I need you to see. But there is, uh, are some visuals going along uh, with the presentation. So let's start with what we can expect for the next few weeks. Most countries around the world, I, I live in South Africa, and I think most of the people uh, tuning into this webinar are from South Africa, but all around the world, most countries now have accepted that lockdown, uh, or at least some version of lockdown, uh, is the right approach, and this is the best practice. Countries that have done this significantly in China uh, and New Zealand and Austria and Germany um, have seen the success of, of lockdown. Other countries, Taiwan, uh, South Korea have gone with a slightly different approach, which includes massive testing, contact tracking, using technology to contract where people have gone. That has also been successful, but in essence, it's actually down 
anybody who is discovered to have the disease is required to go into quarantine. Uh, and then there's a massive contact tracing effort with testing uh, involved. And, and lockdown has to be accompanied by testing, quarantine, uh, and preparation for uh, any medical issues. So kind of every country in the world's uh, followed a similar approach, except a few countries that I'll get to uh, in a minute that haven't gone for a full lockdown and unfortunately are, are seeing uh, that that wasn't a great idea to start with. But where we are right now is we are in the process of thinking about how do we ease out of lockdown? How do we get our economies going again? Um, and, and how do we come out of lockdown? And the first thing to say is that until we have a vaccine, until we can actually cure this disease, we are going to have to continue to do physical distancing, um, protecting ourselves against the disease, uh, and sanitizing everything uh, all of the time. If we can't do that, if your workplace can't maintain a physical distance of two meters between people at all times, if your workplace doesn't allow for sanitization and protection uh, of people from the disease, you, you probably shouldn't be opening. In many countries, you're legally not allowed to open, that's true in South Africa. But legally, ethically, legal is one thing. Ethically and morally, you probably shouldn't open uh, your workplace because we don't have a cure for this. Remember, lockdown wasn't about finding a cure for the disease. It was simply about delaying uh, how many people got it. And I'll talk about that in a second. So until we have a vaccine or a cure or until we've got herd immunity. That, if you, I'm sure you've heard of the phrase, but to be clear about it, that's when about 70, 70% 70 of the population in any country or region has had the disease already and recovered from it. Some people won't recover, sadly, uh, and, and but those people have, have passed away or have gone through really rough weeks. Remember COVID, if you get COVID, it's three or four or even more weeks of really rough uh, um, disease in your body. I had three friends and one family member go through this. A uh, family member had seven weeks of symptoms and it affects your thinking, your brain, function, your body sore. It really is a rough disease. Uh, but once we've gone through it and come out the other side, assuming that we don't get reinfected, there are question marks there, and, and assuming you're not infectious to other people, there are question marks there as well. Then we get what's called herd immunity, and we can kind of get on with normal life. But that takes a, a, a long time. And until that happens, that's about a 12 to 18 month process. I get the vaccine or for herd immunity to develop in the system. Until then, we have to continue with our physical distancing, sanitization, and so on, even as lockdown eases. Now, let's just update ourselves quickly. This is as of the 27th of, of October, uh, not October, April um, of, of 2020. Uh, we, we know these. We don't really need to look at the numbers. The reason for putting this up, though, is to look at a few countries. Um, USA has not gone full lockdown. Some states have lockdown, but some states have not. And I think that gives us the clearest indication of what could happen if we ease up lockdown too quickly and try and go about the business. The UK tried that initially. It was just trying to leave the economy open and going for herd immunity. And the two weeks that they did that for has, has you can see where they are, uh, sort of fifth uh, on the chart. Sweden is often talked about as a model for around the world because they've got a full herd immunity option, keeping the economy open. But Sweden, if, if you chart, are inching their, their way up. I mean, there is uh, heading into the top 10 um, of, and that's deaths, by the way. That's not just uh, uh, instances of it. Um, if, if we look at, at the latest data, I don't think I got the latest data. So this is a few days old. Um, I mean, Sweden, uh, of all the Nordic countries, which is a fair comparison, has the highest. They, they have the most population as well, but still have the highest cumulative number of infections. So bottom line is that different countries around the world have been trying different things, but we are actually seeing that 
this is not a virus you can mess with. This is not a virus that you can play with. Um, and at the moment, easing out of lockdown means we don't just go back to the world as normal. This is the main point uh, of this webinar, is what does normal look like in, in the next few months? Stick with me, because I am going to come to that. And I know it feels like a bit of bad news and a little bit of doom and gloom right up front. It does get better. Uh, there is some good news as we go along. But we, we need to take the reality uh, of the situation into account. And, and here is some of the reality. If we open up our economy too quickly, we have a danger of what happened 100 years ago. 100 years ago, something called the Spanish flu hit the world. Between 20 and 50 million people died uh, with the space of a few months. More people died of the flu than had died in the four years of World War I combined. This is a, from 100 years ago. I've tried to heaten it up and make it easier. This is just the UK. And here is the problem. They had an initial wave of influenza. They knew it was a bad influenza. They tried to deal with it. They thought they had dealt with it. And then they, they, they released quarantine. Winter came around. And then there was this massive wave of deaths that they called the second wave. They then thought they dealt with that through quarantine and so on. And they eased up again. And then there was the third wave that came. And this is what we are concerned about at the moment. We don't know whether the disease is mutating so that people can become reinfected. We're in Korea, telling us that some people can. And we just don't know how many people are going to die. It's, it's anything from half a percent of people who get it all the way up to maybe even as high as 5%. Um, we just don't know enough. And, and there is confusion, isn't there? I'm sure you've seen confusion uh, across social media with Doctors telling us it's not a problem, it's less than the flu, and then other people saying, no, it's worse. And that's the point. We just don't know. So what we tried to do, and this is the point of lockdown and the point of my opening few minutes here, we are pretty certain that most people in the world are going to get COVID. I'm not a medical doctor, so that's not a medical opinion. I'm looking at the data. I'm looking at the scenarios. And the most likely scenario is that most of us will get COVID. There's not a problem for most of us. Half of the world or half of the people who get COVID are not going to have that serious uh, symptoms. About 25% will have mild symptoms. Mild symptoms means it still feels like bad flu, um, but you're not in any mortal danger and after a few days you get better. About a quarter of us are going to have really bad symptoms said it, it's a rough disease a few weeks off work and and not not just being not yourself not being able to function properly and a percentage i don't know whether it's half a percent or one or two maybe even higher are going to die if everybody gets it we're still talking about millions of deaths and what we try to do with lockdown is not to find a cure or to stop that happening it's you've heard this phrase flattening the curve just to try and make sure that we don't have this massive spike in everybody getting the disease at the same time and overwhelming the medical system. Here in South Africa, the purpose of lockdown was not to stop the disease, although it's done a pretty good job at doing that. Our, we're going to see infections increasing now as we ease out um, and, and the economy starts to open up. And we've needed time to prepare. So what's going to happen over the next few months is that when it's not going to be that we don't see the disease increasing, but we are going to be ready for it. And here in South Africa, we've gone with something that actually the rest of the world is beginning to say looks like best practice. Um, and we've heard from a, the World Health Organization, we've been praising South Africa, a lot of international medical experts saying this is the way to deal with it. You have to create multiple levels um, of engagement with lockdown, and you might have to move up and down these levels for the next 12 to 18 months. <laughs> now, luckily as South Africans, we kind of know what this feels like because we've been going through electrical, you know, electricity supply issues, and we've had these uh, stages um, from Eskom for the last few months where we know that the government can just tell us tomorrow we, we're going to have to move to a higher stage and, and that has implications. 
I, I think we've actually learned how to live with that. It's not nice. We don't want it, but you kind of deal with it. And um, somebody made a joke. I'm not sure how funny it is, to be honest, that in a few months' time when Eskom starts going back to its load shedding, again, you're going to have to work out which coronavirus level you're at versus which load shedding stage you're in. So you might be in level three of coronavirus alert, which you're allowed to go shops and buy your food, um, you know, but you're at stage four uh, Eskom load shedding, so you, you can't heat it up at home. Or the other way around, um, you know, you're allowed to go and get a takeout meal, but there's no electricity, so the takeout place is closed. As I say, uh, it wasn't a humor. I'm not sure how funny it is, but I think it's true. I think that's what's in store for us. But the real issue, and, and I've put the economic objectives up on the screen for you. The real issue is actually the medical objectives. And that's what I think the government has been spending time doing. And there's good news if you're South African, because we've actually made ourselves ready, as ready as we're going to be. Um, Charlotte Mesheke Hospital, for example, one of the, the, the places that has been designated a COVID hospital, has set up, it's remarkable, I don't know if you've seen pictures or videos from the hospital, they have got themselves ready uh, for a COVID influx. They've got test kits, they've got doctors. We've brought doctors, controversially, but we've brought doctors in from Cuba and we are going to be bringing doctors in from China and the government is going to activate some uh, local doctors who, who uh, foreign uh, trained doctors who maybe haven't been given accreditation yet in South Africa, there's a plan to fast track them. There's also a plan to turn Soccer City into a military field hospital if we need it. It's been fully costed and fully worked. In three weeks, we can add 1,300 ICU beds into South Africa. Um, and that pretty much doubles the number of ICU beds we've got for COVID response. The point I'm trying to make is that lockdown hasn't really been to um, make sure we don't have any infections. I mean, it has had that effect, but we're going to see infections starting to climb over the next few weeks. Lockdown has mainly been to see whether we are prepared uh, for this and to get ready for the balancing act that's going to be the rest of 2020. And this is the point. People are crying out for this. Open up the economy, please, so that we can get back to work. We couldn't do that before now because the medical system wasn't ready. Now the medical system's ready. We can play this balancing act for the next few months. We open up the economy a little bit. I think if in South Africa we, we go to level four on Friday, I think within a week or two we'll go to level three. So we'll begin to open up the economy and then we'll have to see what happens. We're not going to, there will be infections. Infections will rise. But as long as infections, that rising of the infections doesn't overwhelm our medical capacity, as long as we keep those infections below the medical capacity, we can, we can keep opening up the economy. If it looks as if the infections are growing, we're going to have to lock down again. And that is really the point of this webinar. So if you're still with me and, and, and you've, you've now understood the context of where we are and why we are here, the question now is, well, what do we do about it? And where do we go with this balancing act? The short-term answer in the next few months is we have to open the economy, but we have to keep people's health um, top of our minds. We have to maintain physical distancing of two meters between people, wear masks in public, sanitize regularly. And those facilities have to be available in your business place. If you can't do that, if you can't guarantee physical distancing, um, sanitization, and, and the protection of your staff, you can't open your buildings, the same with your customers. Honest, you can open your buildings. Nobody's going to come. Um, because people are going to understand and see quite quickly that infections start to increase again. This is happening in Germany, by the way. Just last week, second last week of April, Germany started easing lockdown. Two days ago, they, they made an announcement that actually infections are on the rise again, and they might have to 
lock down tighter again if people don't maintain this physical distancing. We've seen it happening, playing out in the US as well, where people are demanding the right uh, to have their freedom to go back to work. And then we, four or five days later, because of that incubation period, there's suddenly spikes in, in those infections. And so people, even if you can open your business, if you can't protect your customers, they won't come. And we're going to have to work out how that works. Let me give you a few examples here. So probably the biggest example is schools. Schools can't go back. I mean, some people can go back, but you can only go back to school if you can maintain a two meter distance between pupils in the classrooms and in the, in the school premises. So most schools are going to have to phase back in. That means letting certain grades, I think matric or grade 12, maybe grade seven for the primary schools, they will go back first. Then maybe the lower grades, grade naught, grade one, grade two, then maybe grade 11 will go back for the next few weeks and months. But there might be some grades that never go back or don't go back this year at all. <laughs> Sorry, I should have given some of you parents some warning when I said that. If you weren't sitting, you've probably sat down and you might need to put something stronger into your coffee to, to get that point around your head. This homeschooling thing is not a few weeks. It, it's, it's for the rest of the year. Even if your child goes back to school in the next few weeks, it's not going to be school as normal. They're probably going to have to do a lot of work at home still and only go to school for a few hours every day. And here's the point. I'm not schools in this webinar, but this is an example of how we need to start thinking. How do you get all of your staff back to work if their children haven't gone back to school? Some of your staff can't come back to work if their children are still at home. We're going to have to, as employers, we're going to have to be thinking about supporting our staff members in, in getting daycare for their children. Communities can step up here. Maybe bowls and tennis and cricket clubs, maybe churches and shuls and mosques can open up their spaces to take some children in doing a little bit of daycare um, and, and then allowing the parents who need to go to work to go to work. Maybe conference centers and hotels who are not going to get any other work any other way can think about that as a business plan that you charge people for that daycare. Maybe you as an employer who needs people to come back to work need to be thinking about this as well. You see, it's not just about schools and getting our kids back to school. There's a whole system change to take place in society for the next few months because this isn't just for the next two or three months. This is for the next 12 to 18 months. That's the point I'm trying to make. Think about aeroplanes as, as another example. How are we going to keep physical distancing on an aeroplane? How are we, are we going to ensure that everybody who gets onto an aeroplane is COVID-free and non-infectious? I don't see how we're going to be getting onto aeroplanes anytime soon. And even if you are legally allowed to, will you want to? I mean, I'm a reasonably fit and healthy middle-aged man. I used to run the London Marathon this last weekend, but I have asthma. And asthma puts me in a vulnerable group. I'm not risking myself getting onto an airplane. And so other people are going to be in the same position. And you can't just assume that everything's going to get back to normal. Take restaurants, for example. If you've got to maintain a physical distance between people, you can only put half the people into your restaurant. Is that economically viable? Um, how do you do that and still keep in business? So it's not as simple as just saying, let's open up the economy. There's, there's no right or wrong here. We do need to open up the economy, but it really isn't as simple as just saying, why is the government keeping us locked down? Open the, I demand you open the economy. We all get back to work. There are so many ripple implications from public transport and how people get to the office to whether their kids are still homeschooling or not, um, to whether any customers even come to you or not. So I hope you're getting my main point, and that is that we are not going back to normal anytime in 2020. This is really rough news, I know, for some industries. There, there is very, there's going to be very little international tourism. 
for the next 12 to 18 months. There will be almost no face-to-face -face conferences and events for the next 12 to 18 months. Very little hotel occupancy, uh, to give a few examples. This is tough news, I know, for some people. And I apologize. I hope you didn't come here for a motivational message. I am going to give you a bit of good news and hopefully some motivation in the next few minutes. Uh, and then we can go to some questions. If you have questions, uh, Make sure that you put them into the questions section uh, as we go along here, and I will try and answer them um, in when it's time. But I'm not here to give you motivational false hope. This is the reality. And the sooner we face the reality, the sooner your business faces the reality of the situation, the better. Let me go a step further and, and just look out a few more years and then I'll, I'll finish with what do we do about it. What can we get for the next few years uh, in the world? Well, the first thing, let's think in, in, in global terms. I honestly think that this could be one of those moments in history where everything changes, where we have massive shifts in, in the global systems uh, of our world. So, for example, right now, if you have a supply chain that comes from the UK or from France or from the United States or Brazil, those countries are in the midst of massive pandemic chaos and crisis. No exports are going to be coming from there. might even be difficult to get services out of those countries. You might want to then shift your your supply chain to to a different country a country maybe like south korea or taiwan or even new zealand where they seem to have dealt with the problem and are coming out the other end of lockdown and are and are open for business we might have that potential in south africa and in some african countries uh where if at the moment we have a situation where uh, we have seemed to flatten the curve and it, it be that the BCG vaccine works. We don't know. It might be, I don't know, whatever reason, we might be able to keep that curve flat. Africa might be open for business and investment. And, you know, rich people and, and investment funds in the world are still looking to invest their money and get returns. It could be. At the moment, there's just that glimmer of hope that Africa might be available. Uh, for business and trade in the next few months. Let's hope and pray that that's the case as Africans. We don't know. In a few months' time, we'll, we'll know whether that's the case. But as we look around the world, there's going to be a massive shift. The second shift that's going to take place is countries are going to think about what we need to keep within our national borders, not just countries, but companies too. Um, the great toilet roll rush of, of February and March 2020, that history will remember, when people went and stockpiled toilet paper, it was probably a silly thing in Africa, but it wasn't crazy in Australia. Most people who hoarded toilet paper had relatives in Australia telling them to do it. You see, as far as I know, Australia doesn't have any of its own toilet paper manufacturers. Um, they import everything from China. So it wasn't stupid for Australians to go out and buy toilet paper because it was a huge possibility they were going to run out. And <laughs> Australians are full of it anyway, so they need a lot of toilet paper. Um, it, it, but it wasn't a clever thing for South Africans to do because we have toilet paper manufacturers here in South Africa. But we are discovering there's a whole lot of things that we don't have in South Africa and in your country, if, if you're tuning in from elsewhere, that maybe we should have. And there's going to be a realignment. Some of your companies are realizing we can't open ourselves up to the compromised supply chain again. And I think over the next five to 10 years, there's going to be a massive realignment of globalization versus regionalization versus nationalization is the wrong word, but bringing everything in-house and moving from offshoring to, to onshoring. Of course, we also have to remember that every disruption that was coming your way is still coming your way. Um, if your industry was about to be digitally disrupted, digitally disrupted, if your industry was facing AI and robotics and automation, 
it's probably accelerated now, not slowed down. Anybody who wanted to get human beings out of the system, this is the best excuse and the biggest reason to do it, isn't it? This COVID disruption. So none of those other disruptions are going away. And in fact, more disruptions will come. Let me give you a nice, maybe more practical example. We are in the middle of a work from home experiment. The greatest future of work experiment ever undertaken in the history of humanity as all of us are forced to work from home. This is how we do conferences now, um, you know, through live storm plat platforms and, and, and uh, you know, this sort of approach. What happens if it works? You know, what happens if this is actually what we prefer to do, that we don't want to go back to the office, that we discover we're actually good at working at virtual teams? Um, it, it's uh, it's actually preferable. We get more productivity. We like it more. Our staff are happier. What happens if we don't ever want to go back to the office? Uh, genuinely, it's a really significant question. I've done work with commercial property guys who are nervous that nobody's going to want to move back to those crowded inner city offices that they can charge massive rentals for. And there's going to be empty buildings and people not paying rent you know, we don't want rush hour anyway, do we? So let's not do that. What about shopping malls? I, I've seen the, the association of shopping malls saying their rentals are down. A lot of them are giving rental holidays. But what happens if those rentals never come back again? Either shops don't come back or the shopkeepers say, we're not having as many people coming to work because a lot of people are now comfortable and confident uh, buying stuff online conferences that might never come back because people realize I don't actually miss them. I don't need to visit my suppliers and meet them face to face. This is good enough. We thought it wasn't, but we've now discovered because we were forced to that it is. So how should we respond? What's the response here? Lauren, I, I see your question. I'll get to that in a second. If anybody else has got questions, if you are with us live, please use the opportunity. I'm going to finish in a few minutes and then have, have time for questions. But here is the main point. This is now the point of what I want to say to you. Too many people, and I, I, I've really, I've actually, as it happens, been worked off of my feet during April. Luckily, I think because my work that I do around scenario planning and helping companies to deal with disruption has obviously been in huge demand right now. Uh, six weeks ago, it was chaos as every single one of my events. I travel around the world all the time. I, I do executive sessions. All of those events, those face-to-face -face events were canceled. And then I realized, no, we just have to take this online and help people to realize you can get value online. And it's been really busy, but I've heard too many people, I've worked with too many clients who say to me, Graham, please help us to get back to normal. And so this is why I put this session, this ACDC, after COVID, during COVID session together, because there is no normal to go back. We are not going to go back to normal anytime in the next 12 to 18 months. After that 12 to 18 months, I truly believe a new normal will emerge. We will have got used to some of what we're doing at the moment, and we won't go back to how it was. There will be a global shift in, in, in geopolitics and macroeconomics and, and, and um, power dynamics and supply chains. There will be a shift in global behavior and social values. That will change the world forever. I truly believe that. Some stuff will come back, of course. It's not going to be an alien planet in two years' time. But I do genuinely think if you are waiting to get back to normal, you're not understanding where we are. And, and I hope that that's what you take away from this session. Now is the time for change. If there were disruptions coming in your industry, those disruptions are accelerated. They're coming faster than they were before. If there were some disruptions you knew you had to do, but just wasn't ever the right time to do them, do them now. That's what you need to do. Take advantage of the disruption that is forced on us to bring the disruptions that you knew needed to happen. Anyway. Um, and then let us look with creativity for new solutions. If you accept what I'm saying, and we aren't going back to normal, then 
a new normal that emerges. This is where if you're a small business, a medium-sized business, and you can bring agility and adaptiveness to the situation now, there is opportunity for you to get huge advantage. The, the two sets of people who are going to come out of this well are the people who are already very rich. Good grief, I wish I was very rich because the shares that you could buy now, the investments that you could buy now would, are just insane. Um, and, and the price at which shares are now, you, it, it just honestly, you can make a fortune. The second group of people that are going to come out of this um, well are going to be people who pivot and see the opportunities, who don't try and get back to the job they had, but look for a new job. I know for some people that's desperately heartbreaking because you've poured a lifetime of work into what you had and you're just seeing it dying in front of you. I, I, that's the nature of the crisis, the pandemic, the global war we're in at the moment. But put your entrepreneurial mindset on, get your opportunity mindset into gear and see what opportunities emerge for you uh, on the side. Now, this is not a coaching session or a consulting session, so I don't know how to give you any more specifics than that. Three things to do. Accept that normal doesn't exist anymore and get a realistic view of what the next 12 to 18 months look like. It's deeply disruptive. Secondly, put your opportunity mindset on here. Don't try and go back to normal, but look at what the new normal looks like and, and move as quickly as possible with your team, as much as your team as you've got left, to move with them to look for the opportunities uh, that exist. And the third thing is, to to sit down and make your plans now. Don't hold on in, in the desperate attempt to wait for normal to return or to try and get something out of what used to be. This is the new reality now. It's at least here for 12 to 18 months, but afterwards there's going to be a lot more happening. And, and set in motion now things to do. That probably means a big entrepreneurial mindset. Experiment with stuff. Try stuff. If it doesn't work, better to try something else. We're back to square one, all of us, and uh, get that entrepreneurial spirit on. Maybe, maybe it's too early for this, but maybe in time. Right. Hi, everybody. That's a classic scenario. I have absolutely no idea uh, what happened there. Um, I, my internet dropped. For I mean, I know my internet dropped. I'm not sure why it dropped, uh, but I kind of had finished the presentation and uh, was about to head into Q&A. So if you are still with us, um, you uh, now get the Q&A. Apologies for that. Not sure what happened. So I'm just going to take these questions as they came um, and uh, pick them up. So let me just uh, get into the question box here and let's see what we've got. So first question that came up from uh, Lauren was, how does the ad industry adjust to the new normal? Um, well, you know, obviously the uh, advertising industry is about getting uh, people to uh, consume marketing and advertising and commercial messaging. And the key thing with the ad industry is looking for the spaces in which you get those views. And a lot of those traditional spaces have gone. You know, is anybody buying uh, paper magazines now? Is anybody buying newspapers? Um, is anybody consuming the traditional spaces that you advertised? Uh, the answer is, I don't know. I'm not in the industry. And it amazes be that actually some of the things that we used to do um, are going to come back again. Um, 
obviously, uh, I think a lot more people are watching TV than used to watch TV. I'd pretty much given up on live TV and TV. I, I pretty much didn't watch the news on TV. It was just a uh, boring cycle. Now there's news again. So maybe, you know, news channels is the, is the way to go. People have shifted to Netflix and so on, and maybe are not watching live TV entertainment. So maybe you've got to shift uh, from there. I can see things coming back that maybe weren't there before. I can see driving movie theaters coming back again, bizarrely. Uh, you know, we all drive up to the movie in our own cars and we physically distancing from other people. So I'm not going to be advertising at a movie theater, but if there's a drive-in theater, what a great place to advertise. I know it's a simplistic answer, but the question, uh, Lauren, is to step back and to say, where are the platforms? on which we can push put commercial messaging um, and uh, those platforms that had already digitally disrupted you know the youtubes and the googles and so on well you know google's share price is soaring at the moment um, and so is zoom and and all the, all the rest because those digital platforms are the space to go so i think there's there's, there's got to be some thoughts uh, around that uh, karen or karen uh, you asked how do you anticipate the live entertainment industry um, Karen, that's devastating um, because we are not going to be gathering. We are not, you can't physical distance in a sports stadium, at a music event, or in a movie theater, even. And even if you could, and this was my example about restaurants, even if we can guarantee, let's take a, a movie theater where you can put one person, you know, in, in every three or four seats, is that commercially viable? You know, we, we can have a rock concert. I'm not sure what a rock concert experience feels like where everybody's got a two meter distance around them. Uh, maybe that's not as cool um, as, as it is when everybody's crammed in together in, um, you know, in the VIP zone. But even if you could do that and people would respect the two meter radius, is that economically viable? Probably not. So a lot of obviously superstar celebrities that have got a lot of money in their bank account have been doing freebies. There's a lot of freebies around, even in my industry. There's a lot of free webinars going on at the moment. We'll get tired of that very soon. A lot of those uh, celebrity superstars we've discovered are not quite as good when they're just singing into a microphone from their home as they are when they've got an entire tech crew behind them. Um, and so we might not want to watch their freebies and they're not going to be able to give freebies away forever. Uh, Karen, I know I'm not answering your question, except to say it's devastating. I don't think we're going to have live events and I think we're going to have to find ways to do online events for at least the next 12 to 18 months and find out how to do that successfully in a way that people will pay for it as well. Um, uh, Janet asks, what are the possible... Um, Again, this is as devastating as the, the live uh, sports and entertainment things because there isn't going to be international tourism this year. Uh, I mean, that's a scenario. It's a prediction. I, you know, I'm not a Nostradamus. I'm not part of public policy. But honestly, I can't imagine that we are going to see incoming international tourists anytime this year. Um, and that's devastating. So, you know, we need government intervention. We need the government to, to come with a plan. It seems as if tourism is going to be the, the next major industry that, that they bail out. Um, but as, a, you know, an example, though, then of so what do you do? So the Kruger Park, for example, has been doing these live safaris, right? Uh, every morning and evening. I don't know if you've been watching it. It's remarkable. Huh? I've loved watching a few of them literally go out live with a game ranger and see what happens. And um, I mean, it, it, it's been a wonderful oasis of calm in the craziness of the world that we live in. I wonder if in a few months time, the Kruger Park might think of monetizing that. What happens if they say it's $1 to join us uh, for a live safari? I wonder if they say $5 for a monthly subscription and join us twice a day, often as you like. And they begin to monetize uh, that safari experience. You can still look at their webcams for free, but the safari experience with a game ranger talking to you uh, and so on, maybe even a private one, uh, digitally at a much higher cost, maybe they might find millions of people sign up from all around the world for that experience. 
And then they have discovered a, a revenue stream. I don't see why not. I don't see why that wouldn't work. And so I think that from a tourism perspective, um, it's, it's awful for the next few months. And then we've got to think about what disruption and digital disruption looks like. It's not as easy for everybody. And, and that's, it's, it's not as simplistic as that. I gave an example in the presentation around repurposing your hotels, repurposing your facilities. I think we've got to think of, of all options um, because it, it, is, uh, it is disastrous. Um, Karen comes back with a question around universities. I kind of talked about uh, ed education, but universities are an interesting case study. Um, they are one of the industries around the world that has had the highest uh, inflation in their pricing. And, and it's ridiculous. Not that I'm saying university professors and school teachers are overpaid. It's just it's massively expensive. Um, and a, a, a hang of a lot of this millennial generation is actually crippled with student debt all around the world, um, more so than any generation in history. And it's just, it's actually become ridiculous. And one of the answers is distance education. One of the answers is doing a lot of the coursework online. I have two uh, university going daughters and they are a little bit disappointed right now because they're saying, we're, basically our lecturer can put their lecture online as a video and we're not getting much more than that. I think that will change, but I actually think that university lecturers, uh, maybe um, some of them have been a little bit lazy over the years. Um, and if, if you're just repeating the same lecture over and over every year and your main goal and your main joy as a university professor is the research and your master's and doctoral students, well, then why should undergraduates bother ever to come back to university? They can just go online, watch your lectures. And, and if you're not giving huge value in the TUT classes, which you normally outsource to your master's students anyway, um, then maybe the model has to change entirely. And, and it was called the flipped classroom, where you got all of the data dump by video anyway, and then you only came to the classroom to have the TUTs and the interaction and, and the Q&A, if you like, with the lecturer. Well, maybe you don't need these massive uh, facilities. Maybe you don't need the residential uh, things. Maybe you don't need the live classroom experience. So I think that education, higher education in particular, might be one of the industries that is most disrupted um, over the next uh, decade or so. Because people realize you can get almost the same level of data dump and knowledge transfer as you can at university, maybe even better, because you can do it at your own speed and faster. Now, the university experience is something different, of course. Um, and that might be what especially my first year uh, daughter is, is missing the most. Um, but that's a different story, isn't it? And that's a different conversation. Um, uh, B. Williams, whatever B stands for, asks, what about the financial system and the value of money? Are cryptocurrencies a viable option for trade? Uh, and so on. Now, okay, uh, I need to be a little bit careful around cryptos. I've been um, hugely uh, skeptical of cryptocurrencies, not the concept of cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies were invented as a means of value transfer for the blockchain environment. And I'm a huge fan of the blockchain. In fact, one of my most watched videos on YouTube is an introduction to the blockchain, which I put up, I mean, five years ago. So I've been a huge investor um, in blockchain technologies. Um, I've actually got a, a company I'm working uh, with at the moment that's developing blockchain technology um, for the COVID uh, crisis. Can't say more than that at the moment. Um, so the blockchain, I <clears throat> uh, definitely think, is is the way of the future. Um, but the blockchain is not about finances. The blockchain is about a way for us to verify information and keep information stored that can't be corrupted, um, uh, and and that is stored stored in a digital system. Um, uh, you know, it's a ledger system, basically. Cryptocurrencies, uh, Bitcoin in particular, were invented as a way of transferring value within the blockchain. 
They were never meant to be an asset class on their own. They were never meant to have a tradable value on their own. Um, I honestly think that most people who got into the early Bitcoin craze didn't fully understand the assets that they were developing. I'm not saying they didn't make money and didn't trade properly, but the underlying value of the asset is the ability to create value transfer within the blockchain environment, not to create a new asset class. And, and that's why I have no idea where, Bit, you know, where Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are going to go, and neither do you, because they're not meant to be tradable assets with their, their own valuation. So invest in them or not, this is not, I'm not a financial advisor and that's not investment advice. But I do think that, that uh, cryptocurrencies, as with uh, any other currencies, um, are not really the, the, the issue. Um, it's not really where the, the value lies. Right now, most stock markets in the world are not um, showing the underlying value of the assets. The stock prices are, are not showing the underlying value of the, of the companies. And the currencies of, of countries around the world are not showing the underlying value of the economy. Uh, it's just craziness at the moment. So invest at your peril, um, invest at your own risk. I do think everything will settle down in, in the next uh, two or three years as everybody just breathes and calms down. We see which companies disappear and which companies come back again. But uh, honestly, you're asking the wrong person about the global financial system because I think it's completely broken at the moment with, with it's basically being run by the traders in the background, not the underlying value uh, of the economy. Does that come back or not? I have no idea, uh, to be honest, afterwards. But I think, uh, you, yeah, invest at your peril at the moment because uh, nothing is indicating underlying value. Uh, right now. I, I don't know, uh, B, if that answers your question or not, you're welcome to come back uh, with something more detailed. But again, I'm not a medical practitioner giving medical advice and I'm not a financial expert giving financial advice on this podcast um, uh, or this webinar. That uh, should be clear. Uh, Renee asks, uh, now that teams have to work from home, do you have any advice on how to best manage data and connectivity usage and costs? <laughs> yes, I do, actually. Um, two things that you should do. The first is you should make sure that your company pays for some of it. Um, this is a requirement of your work, and I think you should have the conversation, and I think companies should step up and provide allowances. Obviously, this is assuming you have access to data um, and that you have access to the, the tech that you need. Um, the second thing is you should also just uh, realize that you are saving money in petrol and car maintenance and travel to and from the office. You're probably saving money in dry cleaning and laundry, um, you're saving money in, in what you used to spend on lunch at the office. So you've got a well um, that you're saving. So if you are in an environment where you had a job and you are being paid a salary and you require data and connectivity, well, don't just sit back as a, you know, a little, uh, I'm not saying you're doing this, Renee, but uh, people shouldn't just sit back and say, oh, well, you know, corporate should survive, you know, provide, come, my company should do this for me. You, you need to take some money that you're saving in one space and spend it on the other space. Having said all of that, I do also think that now is the time in South Africa, if you're from South Africa, for us as South Africans to put way more pressure on our cell phone companies to reduce the cost of data and on our data providers to reduce the cost of data. Uh, our data is the most expensive data in the world and it's ridiculous. And I hope that the government, once it's got over this initial crisis period, can breathe a little bit and then literally step in and our telecommunications um, directorate and, 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 and minister will step in and just force the data companies uh, or, or force the price of data down um, because it is ridiculously expensive and we are going to need more access to data than we've ever needed before. Right. I think, as far as I can see, that I have answered, let me just check the chat box. Some of you might have used the chat box. Um, so Mark has said, we have to change the questions we ask. What opportunities does this crisis uh, 
or this reset. Uh, Mark, I, I do think that this is the does have the potential to be a reset. Um, and I agree with you. I think we must ask different questions. Maybe let me use that as an opportunity to end. We're, we're coming to the end of the hour, and I see um, that we're starting to get a few people drop off. So let me let me end, um, and you can contact me. Um, let me just uh, put up my contact details again uh, for you just so that you've got them and you're welcome to contact me and have a look at some of the resources our team has made available on LinkedIn and, and YouTube in particular. But I honestly believe that the normal that we had before this COVID crisis is actually part of the problem. Um, in South Africa, you know, we were having the conversation about inequality and a an apartheid spatial planning and NHI. Now we see what the problem is. Uh, some of us have seen the problem for a while. My company started started a foundation a number of years ago. Our, our family uh, is involved in volunteering in township schools and so on because the the problem had become more and more evident, and we felt something needed to be done. But now everybody sees the problem. You know, the richest person in the world today is only as protected from COVID as the poorest person is. Um, and, and we've got to have health care for everybody. Um, and, and so when we come out of this COVID crisis, hopefully we come out with an attitude that says, oh, at least now everybody understands the problem and let's do major economic reform. I, that doesn't mean just in case some people are thinking that I'm a communist and that the only other option besides capitalism is, is socialism and communism. I think there are hybrid models and new models available. And I think that hopefully this reset helps us to find some new models. If we look at the, the first world countries, let's take America, for example. America is showing us now how broken it is. It's crony capitalism that's been in place, where they gave a $2 trillion tax relief a, a year or two ago, um, you know, to the rich people and gave money back to all the, all the big corporations who are now coming begging to the government to give them a bailout. I mean, it's ridiculous. Harvard University, which has something like $40 billion in savings in an endowment, asks the American government for a bailout and accepts $9 million in bailouts. Um, but of course, won't forgive the fees, the, those, those student loans that the students have. This is crony capitalism at its worst, uh, built as an economic system for the benefit of the rich. And then it's socialism when things go wrong because these companies want some money back in bailouts. Um, yeah, I am going on a little bit of a rant. And, and I do think that this is a moment to reset, to reset everything. For you as a small business owner, as a, as a, as a business person, uh, as an employee, this is a moment for you to rethink and to reset. This is a marathon, people, not a sprint. I've been sprinting for the last five or six weeks. Uh, in the last five or six weeks than I've had in the last five or six decades. Um, and I'm wearing myself out and I'm needing to slow down myself and to realize I can't keep sprinting for 12 to 18 months. I've got to get into a bit of a marathon pace now because we're in a new reality, a new normal. Right? It's a cliche. I know some of you don't like that phrase, but this, this is the new reality of the world we live in. Let's find a new pace. If your kids are going to have to work from home uh, and, and, and do homeschooling for the rest of this year, what is that going to look like sustainably for you? If your business is dying, don't don't desperately cling on to it. What does that mean for you? Uh, let's reset, recalibrate, find our new pace and our new rhythm. Let's get through this. Let's help each other in our communities to get through this as much as we can. And when we come out of the other side, let's hope we come out of the other side bruised, battered, but not broken. And that we come out of the side, the other side with a better world. As, as better people. This will always be probably the toughest few years any of us ever lived through. Uh, but let's make sure we, we aim to come out of the other side intact. So thank you for joining. Um, for those who joined live and, and a few of you uh, putting a thanks up here in the thanks box, thank you for
for joining. Um, I hope this has been a worthy investment of your time, um, and I know it is something that you can share uh, with others. It, it is being recorded, um, and I hope you take this message to your family, to your community, to your team, um, and that you make the most of this time that we are in and do come out the other side uh, better. So thanks for joining us, and thanks to Simply Biz for hosting this webinar series.